I had asked uh, several weeks ago if uh, a friend of mine would come and speak today knowing that I, I couldn't be in both services teaching that class today. And uh, he agreed to come. And I'm really excited for you to get to know him a little bit. Um, he pastors the Foursquare Church in Hanover. And whenever I say that, people always go, I don't I even know if Foursquare had a church in Hanover. Well, they do. Uh, it's called Emerge. And he'll talk a little bit about that. He had had an independent work there and then merged it into Gettysburg, for, uh, a Hanover Foursquare Church that was struggling and in need of some, some new leadership, and, and the church is doing incredible now. He planted Emerge uh, as an independent church in 2015, but he graduated from Foursquare's Bible College, Life Pacific College, where I went, and also uh, the pastor at Frederick Foursquare happens to be here today. Abe, just say, you spoke here before. We have a Foursquare church in Frederick, too. Did you know that? They're all around, like we're taking over. Well, we're really not, but, uh, but yeah, no, we've got Foursquare churches here and there, and Herb is uh, had four square roots and, um, and then got involved in a church in Westminster and planted out of Westminster into Hanover. And God is doing some great things in Hanover Four Square now called Emerge. And it's really exciting. And I just thought, you know what, you need to know him um, and some of the people that pastor in our, in our local area, as well as you might find yourself living someday in Hanover or have friends in Hanover that would want to be in a church in their town and you couldn't send them to a better place and emerge. They, they meet right behind the, the big Walmart there on the, the Golden Mile, as we call it. And, uh, and if you, you get in that parking lot, you can never find your way out of it. But if you find your way out of it in the back, you will pop out right next to their church. So um, would you welcome up Herb as he comes to share with us this morning? I know you're going to enjoy this. Come on out. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks so much, Pastor Mark. Um, thanks for inviting me, and, and also friendship. Like, there are a number of Foursquare churches in this area. It's just this really wonderful hub. Hi, Abe, good to see you. Um, it's really been wonderful, and, and Mark has really just embraced us, um, and it, it's, it's been great. And also, you know, this church is awesome. He's been knocking it out of the park here for a long time. You, you should be proud of your pastor. He just does, he's, he is awesome. And, um, you know, you guys are a few steps ahead of us, so just having the encouragement and the, getting the feedback from, from Mark is, is just wonderful. Um, we missed each other at Life Bible College by um, a year. So I graduated, and then he started the next year. It probably was, a, was really good. I don't know if he would have invited me here if we went to school together, because I was a full-on butthead, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, maybe we would have been awesome friends because of that. So, But, yeah, um, good, good being here, and, and it's just an honor. Um, today. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 5. Um, so if, if you have a Bible with you, feel free to open it up. We'll have the, the words on the, the screen as well. But I wanted to start off quick, quick with just a promise from Jesus. just came right out of his mouth in John chapter 7. He said, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So as, as Christians, we live in the, the overflow of of his grace, with the overflow of what, what God has done for us. In other words, our, our spiritual experience, so our, you know, praying and reading the Bible and our worship and our generosity and the things that we do, our service, those things don't, don't get us to God. Those things are the result of God. It's the overflow of what, what he has done in us um, through, through Christ Jesus. And the, you know, the flooding in the, in the ancient days, you know, ancient civilizations, flooding actually allowed for, like the overflow allowed for, for civilization to, civilization to rise. Um, there, there were four rivers that, because of the flooding that would happen from a river, that, that's where human civilization started. And one of them was in Egypt. So once a year in, in Egypt, the Nile River would flood. And it, it needed a flood because by doing that, it spread life and, and nutrients all throughout what have otherwise have been a desert. So if it didn't flood in a particular year, crops would fail and people would die. So they, they required that, that flooding and, and they had no control over it. They couldn't make it happen. They couldn't do anything to make the flood come. But what they did is they lived where the flood happened. And and that's what we need to do spiritually. Like we live in the, the floodplain of God's grace. We, we can't make the flood happen. We can't make the overflow happen. But we, we live in the flood floodplain of his grace. Now our problem is that we block the flow. Like G Jesus wants to flow into us and then out of us. But, but we block the flow all the time. Um, there was a, a new dam that was built on the, the Nile River. Here, a picture here, you can see it. So here's Egypt. 
um, and river, this is the Nile River, it, it flows north and south of the equator. So in 2013, Ethiopia, um, which has part of the Nile River, they, they built a dam called the Greater Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And they did it because they wanted electricity, so they wanted to harness the, the river in order to, to get electricity. The problem is, modern day Egypt still needs water. And them building the, um, Ethiopia building the dam reduced the flow of water and, and started changing um, the environment in Egypt. And suffice it to say, the nation of Egypt has not been happy about this. In fact, in, in 2014, um, the, the president of Egypt um, had a meeting and he was on a hot mic, he didn't know it, um, and he suggested hiring terrorists to go to Ethiopia and blow up that dam. Oh, that's pretty hardcore, right? And for years now, there, there's been the, the th ongoing threat of a water war in that region, all because somebody is blocking the flow, blocking the river. And that is, a, is too often a picture of our spiritual lives. So our, our sin and our, our selfishness and our, our fear and our distraction and our offense, like all of these things, it, it, it blocks the flow of what Jesus said want, he wants to do where he flows into us and, and then flows out. And then we go to war with everybody around us, right? And the devil's throwing up dams all over the place, just trying to, to block the flow and, and, and cause pr problems in our lives. Like, it's no wonder we are so screwed up. It's no wonder that there's, like, been no revival in, in our nation for, for so long. It's no wonder that churches are disappearing all over the country because we're blocking the flow. Like we're not allowing God to, to flow into our lives and then, then to flow out. Like we've dammed up the river. It's time to let the river flow, right? Like we, you know, we've sang that in generations past. This is, this is why. Because when we block the, the flow, it, it stops the process that Jesus wants to, to have in our lives of overflow. And in, in Romans chapter 5, we're going to hang out there for a little bit. Paul teaches us how to live in the overflow instead of, of clogging it up. He's already kind of established, if you're familiar with Romans 5, he's established that it's, it's by grace and not through works that we, that we come to God. And then he says this in, in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So what, like how do we live in, in the overflow? The first step that we all need to start at, that we need to live in, is, the, is that we rest in it. We rest in the overflow. We gotta, we gotta stop the spiritual rat race, right? I gotta do more, I gotta pray more, I gotta read my Bible more, I gotta serve more, right? I gotta do more and more and more and more in order to get to God, in order to, to make him happy. And listen, what, what Paul is telling us is that I don't need to get to God. Like, I am already there. I have peace with him. I'm not trying to get peace from God. I'm, I am at peace with him. I stand in, in his grace. I, I have hope. The, these things are already a done deal. It, it's, it's mine already. Like, striving, striving didn't get me here. So, so why should I start now? Why should I try? It's just a poor method uh, of, of walking out our faith in Christ. And um, John, in, in John chapter 1, he, he opens up his gospel saying, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's a strong word. The right to become children of God. And l listen to me today. Like you, you belong in the house. You belong in God's house. You do. Like you, you have a room. You have a queen-size bed. Like it's got a divot that, that matches your body. Isn't it great when your mattress, just, it gets to, you just lay down and, oh, that just fits perfectly. Right? You, like you don't have to earn the right to your own room in your house. And, and that is so true of us spiritually. We don't have to earn it. And so the... The wonder of this, this peace is that we're no longer tormented about our relationship with God. Like, we're, we're at rest with him. My, my wife Emily and I, um, she's, she's at Emerge right now. She's, she's running the cafe. <laughs> um, 
I said, are you going to come with me? She said, nope, I got stuff to do. All right. Um, but she, used, she and I, we, we used to be tormented in our marriage. And gosh, I could, I could tell you a long story about that. She didn't think that I loved her. I thought that she thought I was a crummy husband. And so we, we just lived, we existed in our marriage in a place of, of insecurity. We couldn't rest in each other's presence. We were always wondering, what, is, what do they really think about me? And through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, we started to figure this thing out. out. And now our relationship is at peace. Like we, our home is a refuge. I, I love being home. She loves being home. Like it's just a, it's a wonderful place because we were able to come to that place of rest in our relationship. And listen to me, if you are tormented in your spiritual life, like you need to change your, your thinking. You need to change your belief system. And that's what I'm challenging you here as we begin this is, is get, like find your rest in God. He's already provided it for you. You don't have to do anything. He did it all uh, th- through his son going to the cross. And so the word of God tells me I'm at peace. Like, I don't have to wonder where I stand with him. L- look at this in verse, verse 6 of Romans 5. These are mind-blowing verses. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, while we were sinning, they they nailed him to the cross, right? Jesus died for us. On your worst day, Jesus was loving you. Like, let's get real about this. Th- think about the darkest moment in your life. Like the, the moment that if you don't want anyone else in this room to know about. Think about that. I, I can think of one. I got a really dark one that I'm thinking of right now. In that moment, Jesus was loving you. What? In that moment. And there, there is nothing you could ever do to make Jesus, to make the, the Father, to make the Holy, for, there's, there's nothing you could do for God to love you any more, and there's nothing you could do to cause God to love you any less. And we need to embrace that fact and, and, and to, to be at rest in his presence. And so, so first of all, again, we need to understand that my spirituality comes from that place of rest. We, we, we rest in the overflow. But then it, it moves on, and, and Paul goes on, and we see that we, not only do we rest, but we also mature in the overflow. We rest, but we don't squat because God wants to move us somewhere. He, he's taking us somewhere. Look at this in, in verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts, the overflow, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now this, this process of like endurance, you know, suffering, endurance, character, and, and hope, that like this is not a to-do list. It, it really describes a process that God wants to, to move me through. He, he's moving me somewhere. So suffering moves me towards endurance, and endurance moves me towards character, and character moves me towards hope. And so it is the process of spiritual maturity. All of these things need to happen for, for me to move to the place that, that God wants me to, to be. I, I turned 50 back in April, and I was, I'm like, what the stinking heck? I can't be 50. Like, that's just crazy. I, f- I felt like I turned 30 like a minute ago, you know? But if I look in the mirror, I recognize, oh, yeah, you did. You're right. <laughs> um, but something that, that I, I come to recognize is, like, I actually, ha- I've lived a lot of life now, if, if I think about it. And, and I'm learning something as I'm, I'm, I'm starting to grow a little bit older. I'm, I'm learning that time alone doesn't make me wise, right? I can keep doing the same stupid thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Like when Emily, um, you know, we're at home and she's, she starts crying about something, every time I'm like, Emily, let me, let me fix that for you. I do it every time. 
And ladies, do you want your man to fix you or do you want him to listen to you? Right? But I fall for it every time. It's like I just walk into the trap every time. So, like, time doesn't cure stupidity. (laughs) It It just doesn't. In other words, maturity isn't automatic. It doesn't just happen because we grow older. It doesn't just happen because it happens. It takes some movement. And either, either I move towards maturity or I stay stuck in the same place. And I, I hate to break this to you. I hate to break it to you. But an, an, a necessary, indispensable tool in God's toolkit of bringing maturity into your life is suffering. Hardship, difficulty, like you can't get around it. That's the, the process started with suffering. And in, in, like Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. It is necessary. You, you can't get around it. You have been grieved by various trials so that the, that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it's tested by fire, may found, be found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So for us to get to the place God wants us to be, we, we, have, to, we have to go through pain, which really stinks, because I hate pain. I, I hate it. When I, when I was a, a teenager, a young teenager, I got braces. I, was, I got them a little late in the process. I think I was 13, and my dad got... Um, you know, dental insurance, and they're like, okay, time for, for braces. And I hated braces. If I could have taken a, a pair of pliers and ripped them off of my teeth, I would have, except that would have hurt more, right? I just hated them. I, I played trombone. I was a band geek, so like, it, you know, trying to play trombone with braces, it would just rip up my, my gums on the inside. And they just hurt. They tighten them, and they, they were the worst. And, um, you know, my, my teeth are still crooked. You know why my teeth are crooked? Because I got retainers. And retainers hurt too. But you know what was different about retainers? I could take them out. Right? They sat, they sat on my dresser for months on end. I didn't wear them because they hurt. I didn't want to go through the pain. Because I didn't want to submit to the pain of the process. And as a result, my, my teeth are still crooked. My mom's still mad at me for wasting all that money. <laughs> and listen, some, some tough stuff has happened in your life. I don't need a prophetic word to, to tell you that. We, we all have had tough stuff, right? You might be in the midst of, of it right now, or it, it, you might be bitter and angry or just confused about what happened in the past. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of who did what. Like, is it God's fault? Is it the devil's fault? Is it my fault? Is it just bad, bad people? That's another sermon. But I will tell you this. God will use your pain if you will let him. He will use your pain to bring maturity out of you. But you got to submit to the process. You can't rip the braces off. And the, the process is, is clear. Paul went through it. I'll just outline it again. First, you endure it. Like sometimes all you can, sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is just hold on tight. Like just don't quit, right? It's all, it, it's all you can do. Don't rip the, the braces off. And then you, you move from that place of endurance into, into character. You respond to it the right way. You don't just go through it, but you grow through it. You, you stop c- grumbling and complaining. This is, this is why complaining is such an issue in scripture is because it hijacks this process of maturity. You don't make everyone around you miserable while you're going through it. Or you don't go to, to this and that and like trying to numb the, the pain. Most sin in our life is just we just want to numb the pain, right? And the good thing, so we, we move from suffering to endurance to character. And the good thing, and listen to me, this is like God will, God will move you into place of hope. He will. That is the promise that Paul is telling us. The, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Hope will come. You're, you're not going to be stuck in it forever because that is the promise of the Lord. And, and this is the tough stuff of Christianity, but it, it really is the, the deep stuff as well. My, my father-in-law 
Um, it, he is a, a man of God. And I, I'm just really blessed to have him as, as a spiritual dad in my life. And Ed has suffered with excruciating back pain for, for years, for, for decades. He, he, has, he was born with scoliosis. He has scoliosis, arthritis, and a herniated disc all in the same spot. It's like this triple whammy. They, they all hit in the exact same spot in, in his lower back. And so pain is his, his daily experience. He wakes up with pain. And he, he gets himself together, and then he, he goes through his day and until he can't take it anymore, and he goes to bed. And it, 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 pain is his daily companion. And he prays all the time for God to take it from him, and he believes, right? right? But so far, God hasn't taken that, that pain away from, from him. And something that, that Ed says repeatedly, it, it just comes automatically out of his mouth. He, he was over our house a couple weeks ago, and it, it, he did it again. He, he just said it. It came right out of his mouth. So he will, like, drop this wonderful nugget of, of spiritual wisdom, and then he'll say this. That's what 40 years of pain will teach you. That's what 40 years of pain will teach you. Not bitterness. Not, not some cynical opinion. Like, just wisdom. It just comes out of him. That's what 40 years of pain will teach you. And our family gets to live in the overflow of that, of that man's maturity. Just the, the blessing of what comes out of his life. My, my daughter, when she's going through something tough in, in her life, she's struggling, she goes and talks to granddaddy. Right? She knows that he, he's got wisdom for her. And, I, and I'm like, go for it, you know, because we just get to live in that overflow. And, and our problem is that we, we get frustrated with the pain, and when we get frustrated with the pain, then we reject the, pro, the process. We dam up the river because we, un, we misunderstand the necessity of suffering. We, we think that God's being mean to us. And I've been there before. I'm sure you have. Like, God, why? How can you do this to me? And, and we misunderstand the place. So instead of, it, instead of this suffering generating endurance and, and character, and hope we get stuck in frustration and complaining and despair because we don't let God um, work through the, the process. So how, how do we get unstuck? I, I've really wanted to share just kind of a, a new understanding of pain and, and change our belief system, but what's something practical? It's really important for us to get practical. So I wanna, I wanna share a, a verse that's, that's been on my heart for the last few months, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It teaches us a practical step that we can take to get unstuck when we're going through difficulty and how we can move into maturity. So Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And, and this little nugget, this short little verse, memorize it, it's, it's just so good, it can help to unlock the, the key to maturity in your life. So the first thing that this teaches us is to practice gratitude, right? Be thankful. Just start doing it. Um, th there were two men who were walking through a, a field. One day they climbed over a fence and they're walking through a field, just, just wanted to do, do a shortcut. And as they're walking through the field, they see a bull. And then they start moving quickly towards the, the, to get to the other side of the field. And the bull notices them and the bull starts, starts charging them. And they just book it. And, and start running, trying to get to the fence. And they, they realize, we're not going to make it. This bull is running so fast, we're not going to make it to the fence. And as, as they're running, the one guy says, John, do something. Pr pray. And John's running next to him and says, I, I've never prayed. I, I don't know how to pray. How, am I, how do I do that? And his friend says, I don't know. Just come up with something. And John says, he's running for the fence. He says, okay, I'll just pray what my dad prayed to the dinner table every day. He just repeated every day, Lord, for what we are about to receive, let us be thankful. <laughs> right? <laughs> so thankfulness needs to become automatic. It needs to, to come out of repetition in, in our lives. Do, do you have, have you ever had a, a, a negative repet, repetitious thought, repetitive thought? Have you ever had one like ang anxiety? Um, you know, it, it has a big part to play in depression, worry, like we just, insecurity, and we just ruminate over it, and it goes around and around in, in our, our minds. I have one, I have a negative thought that's automatic. I've had it since I was a teenager. 
I, still, I say it to myself all the time, just knee-jerk reaction. I, I say this, you are such a loser, right? I say that to myself. Such a loser. And that was, that, that still comes to my mind because of the neural pathway that has been, um, been burrowed into my brain through the repetition of me saying that. And then, th then I believe that life reinforces that repetitive thought. Now, the, the, another good sermon on negative thinking and, and changing that with the word of God. I won't go into that. But just understanding the power of repetitive thoughts. And we c if we can do that with a negative thought, we can do it with, with a positive thought. as well. We can do it with gratitude. So instead of this, this worry going through my head or this confusion going through my, my head or resentment going through my head over and over, I can replace that with thankfulness, with gratitude. Be thankful so that it just becomes automatic. You have to, th you, you gotta make, do the discipline to make it happen, but eventually it just, it just becomes repetitive, right? God, thank you for that, this new job. Thank you, right? It just... Knee-jerk reaction. It just becomes automatic. God, thank you so much for my family. I'm just really thankful for, for that, Lord. Father, thank you for that parking spot that opened up at, at Walmart so I don't have to walk all the way across the, the parking lot. Thank you. It just becomes automatic. God, thank you for this traffic that I'm stuck in. Huh? If I have... If, if I've created the neural pathway, if, if I, it's become automatic, that's what starts to come out, right? God, thank you for this difficult thing that is going on in my life. It just comes out because I'm thankful for all the other stuff as well. And it's just a whole new way of approaching life, which really leads to the next step. So we just put it into practice, but we, we begin to delight. When we, when we practice gratitude, we begin to delight in imperfect gifts, be thankful in all circumstances, right? Emphasis on the word all. How many people are thankful when you get the awesome job, right? You get the promotion. Are you thankful for that? Heck yeah, right? How many people are thankful when you get healed, either by a doctor's hand or by a saint's prayer? Thank you. Thank you, God. Like, th that's easy, right? But what about when you're out of work and can't find a job? What about when you don't get better? Is that part of all circumstances? That's when gratitude gets hard. Like there, just to give you a, a word picture of it, like there, there's nothing, nothing better than my, my wife. She's, she's an awesome cook. I can make a great bowl of cereal. That's, that's about as far as I go. Um, but, you know, she'll make me a, a, a juicy steak, medium rare, and, and a, a loaded baked potato with bacon, sour cream. Like life is just better with bacon, isn't it? It's just, it's just so good. And so I'm just re getting ready to dig in. And then she plops a salad next to my plate. Like, what the heck did you do ruin a, uh, ruining a perfectly good meal with that salad? Right? Get ye behind me, salad. <laughs> and then it's time to pray. So bow my head and pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, thank you for this steak. Lord, thank you for this baked potato. Amen. And it ends there. Right? Because I, I can't recognize that actually that salad is probably the best thing on the, on the plate for me, but I, I can't see that it is a, that it is a good gift. And I instead, I, I resent it. I look at it as a, an imperfect gift. And listen, that just like that salad, there are things that are in your life that are imperfect and you, you, we have a natural tendency to resent them. But God says, look at it differently. This imperfect gift actually can bring you somewhere where you never could, could get to on your own. That imperfect job that when the alarm goes off in the morning, you're like, Ugh. That imperfect marriage. <coughs> and you're thinking in your head, did I marry the wrong person because your relationship is imperfect? God might be using imperfect gifts in your life to get you somewhere you could never, ever, ever get to if it wasn't in your life. You hear me? And we need to embrace them instead of resenting them. 
And so the last thing that, that this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 is telling us, you know, we, we practice gratitude, we delight in imperfect gifts, and then we, we begin to change our perspective. We look, we look at things differently. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. This thing that is so hard, this thing that you, you just wish would get removed, but it, it is God's will in your life. It, and it, when we understand this, it, it starts to change everything. On March 16th, 2020, the world changed, right? I don't, I don't need to remind you, you guys know. And, um, you know, as, as a pastor of a church that met in a movie theater, like, it, w- it was a existential crisis. And I, and I know that, that Gettysburg Foursquare, like, you had some exi- existential crises throughout that, that process. We, we all went, went through it. And I wondered, am, are we going to survive this? Are we going to survive this? And th- there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of disruption and none of it was fun at all. And Emerged Church, just like, your, just like the, this house of the Lord, resolved to respond the right way, to, to respond in, in faith instead of fear. That, and we, we didn't do anything stupid. Like we, we, we weren't dangerous. We changed the way we did church without stopping being the church. And I know you guys did the same because I talked with Pastor Mark throughout the whole process. But in our hearts, we wanted to, to respond the right way. And we, we decided to, like we started a building renovation in the middle of a pandemic. Like what the heck, right? That's not the time to get a loan. <laughs> and last year, in 2021, we began to emerge out of the, the pandemic full of faith and stronger than we were before. All, all the fear I had on March 16th was just poof, gone. Because I saw how God worked through the difficulty of the the situation that we all were going through. And this might sound strange to say, but but I I thank God for COVID. Not for the death. Not for the not for the disruption. I mean, we had a lady in our church a a few months ago, both her parents died within three days of, of each other from COVID. Like, that's horrible. And I and I know there's been death in this house. So it's, that, that's not what I'm thanking God for. I'm thanking, I thank God for the opportunity of suffering that we've all been through. I thank God for the opportunity of suf- suffering in order to, bring, to, to, to grow maturity in my life personally and also in, in the life of our church. We would not be where we are in 2022. I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for 2020. And listen, there, there's no nice, neat theology for suffering. Suffering is messy. Suffering is painful. You know, trying to sort out, as I said earlier, the the exact cause of it, whose fault is it, that's, that's tough. I mean, that's one of the toughest theological questions on the planet. But as I said earlier, I, I know that if I will submit my, my heart in the midst of pain to God, that he will use it. And so this thing that's going on in my life that I hate, it actually might be the, the very thing that he wants to use in my life. A few, a few weeks ago, um, I, I was cleaning at our, our church building. I'm, I'm the church janitor. <laughs> and so I was, I was mopping the, the floor, clean, scrubbing toilets, and I, I actually, I covet that time because it it's just a really wonderful time to, to, to pray over our, our church before we, we have our, our weekly services. And, um, and I knew that I... I knew this message, and this, this has been just rumbling in my heart for, for a number of weeks now. And as I was, was cleaning, mopping the floor, I was like, I need to put this into practice. And so I, I just began to, to thank God. And I started with, God, thank you. Lord, thank you so much for, for my wife. She's the best, the best spouse on the planet. I'm so grateful for her and how, how she loves me and supports me. I th- I'm grateful. God, I th- I'm so thankful for my daughter. Like, she's just growing up full of faith. She loves the Lord. I'm, I'm thankful, Lord. I'm thankful for this church. Lord, I'm thankful for what you're doing in this church. I'm thankful for our home. I'm thankful for the financial security that you've given me in my life. So I just started going through all of these, these things and, and just thank, you know, thanking the Lord, practicing gratitude. 
And as I was, was doing that, the, I felt the, the, the spirit whisper in my ear, just say, Herb, you need to go deeper. Go, go deeper with this. And I said, oh, I get it. All, all circumstances. And so I, I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for COVID, right? I mentioned that. Lord, thank you. Thank you for years of, of hard ministry. Feeling like a failure. Feeling like I didn't measure up. God, thank you. Thank you for that. God, thank you for the, the jobs I worked. Like, thank you that, for working at Giant as a dairy manager. Thank you, I, th those years I was working for a real estate agent. Thank you for the years I was in, in health care when all I wanted to do was be in, in ministry, in full-time ministry. And I was so frustrated, and I, I, I complained and I grumbled about it, but Lord, thank you for that. Thank you. And I just started going through the tough things in life. God, God thank you that I grew up the son of an alcoholic. Thank you that I, I grew up in a home racked by addiction and the, and the ways that you, you've matured me through that. Thank, thank you, Lord. And so I'm just, again, just walking clean and going through all those things, and then, then I heard him say again, go deeper. And I didn't understand. And then I got it. Lord, thank you for the suffering to come. Lord, thank you for the hard things that I'm going to go through in the future. God, thank you for the friends that might betray me. God, thank you for the, sick, like the sickness, the diagnosis that I might get or someone that I love might get. God, thank you for, for times of financial struggle that I might go through. God, thank you for that. And I, and I began to feel the pleasure of the Lord in that moment. And he said, yeah, now you're getting it. Because I know that God isn't done with me yet. And I know that God isn't done with you yet. And if he's not done with us, that means suffering is going to come because it is an indispensable, necessary tool for him to get us to a place of maturity. And he wants to mature us. Do you hear me? If you're gonna live in the overflow, if you're going to have wisdom, if you're going to be mature, then you're going to have to go through it. And so, Lord, thank you even for that. There, there is a, a deep place of, of gratitude. There is a deep place of worship that he wants to draw us into, that he wants to draw you into this morning. But it takes the, the willingness to let go of our false right to happiness. God never promised us happiness. We don't have a right to it. If we let go of that, that false right and we embrace the process, then just the, the, the wonderful things that are going to come. Suffering leads to endurance. Endurance leads to character. And character leads to hope. Do you want to go through the process today? Then we, then we need to respond the right way. And I, I want to I wanna invite you. We're going to take a moment of prayer. Um, if you could just bow your head and close your eyes. I'm not going to do anything weird, so don't worry about that. Um, just think about some difficult things that are going on in your life. It might be now. It might be in the rearview mirror. But it's been tough for you um, to make sense of it, and it's been tough for you to see how God can be in the midst of it. Now, I, I don't believe God causes everything, but I believe that God can be in the midst of it. And I want to invite you to be thankful today in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you today. Father, we, we offer these painful moments to you. Lord, we, we offer you the confusion to you. Lord, we, we offer the struggle to you. And we are grateful for the process that we are in and the place that you want to bring us to. We are thankful, Lord, for all circumstances, even this thing that we're thinking of right now. We're thankful, Lord. 
because we know that you are a good God. And because you're a good God, there's a good place you want to get us to. If we would just hold on, respond the right way, and step into hope. So we are, we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful, Lord. We are grateful, Lord. We're grateful for the opportunity. We're grateful. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We just, we just say it over and over in our hearts. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Your love is so great. It never ends. Your love is so great. It never ends. Can you say amen with me? Amen. We have a, the opportunity this morning to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, hopefully you, you grabbed a, um, a, a bag on the way in with a, a cracker and a, a cup of juice. If you can get that out. Um, if, you, if you don't have one, um, there are some folks in the aisle that can um, get them for you. If you just raise your hand, get their, grab their attention. We call this different things, this, this tradition that, that Jesus started. Um, you know, the Lord's Supper is one. Often we call it communion. Um, more liturgical churches call it the Eucharist. And that word Eucharist comes from the, the Greek word Eucharisteo, which means to be thankful. <laughs> be thankful. And so Jesus seeing the joy before him, he suffered the cross. He went through the, the suffering because he knew what was on the other side. And so he had an attitude of submission and a, an attitude of thankfulness to his father, even though it, it was so hard. And today we are, being, we, are, we are invited into the Eucharist. We are invited into a, a heart of thankfulness for us to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus and to have the same response that he had. Father, if this is your will, let it be done. If this is your will, this difficult thing, then let, I'm all for it. I'm on board, Father, and I'm grateful. Let's have the same heart as Jesus today. Let's, let's stand together, and if we can lift up the, the, the cracker that represents Jesus' body to the Lord as, as one body, as his church today. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, um, he took the bread and he broke it. And, and after he gave thanks to the Father, he, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together in faith and, and gratitude to our Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you wanna peel back the, the top of the cup and lift that up before the Lord. After supper was ended, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood, not the blood of sheep and goats, but the, the blood of the son of God. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And let's, let's drink in joy and in gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. We are grateful. We are grateful, Lord, and we follow you where you take us into this, this wonderful in invitation to maturity and to live in the overflow of your grace. Amen. Amen. We're, we're going to respond in our hearts with a song of worship. There's room up here if you want to, you know, come before the Lord and, and as just an expression of surrender. The, the altar is open, and let's just enjoy worship our Savior.